Peter. We're going to talk about infrared spectroscopy today, which is a really important tool for analyzing the structure of organic molecules. Now, all spectroscopies work uh, generally the same way. We're going to take our sample, we're going to irradiate it with some kind of energy. Uh, in, the, in our case, we're going to be using infrared lights. That's why we call it IR spectroscopy. And we're going to take a molecule. Let's say we have a molecule like this, a, a molecule of HCl. We're going to hit it with a photon of light. Now, that photon uh, is going to be described in terms of its energy. Its energy can be just put in terms of its wavelength. And uh, so we have this constant in the speed of light. And so we see that as the wavelength, if the wavelength gets smaller, the energy increases, so light of a smaller wavelength, a shorter wavelength is higher in energy. And uh, we're going to be using a different, so this is wavelength, this lambda here, and we're going to be using this, this V with a line over it, is short for wave number. And these are in units called reciprocal centimeters, so it's centimeters to the minus one. And <clears throat> You can see they have an inverse relationship, so that's where the negative one comes from. And uh, we'll, we'll find that energy has a direct relationship with these wave numbers. So we're going to be using these numbers, reciprocal centimeters, to describe the photons of light that we're using. And what we need to remember is that as you increase your wave number, increase the, the number, uh, you're increasing in energy. Okay, well what's going to happen is if, when this sample is irradiated, when it's, when it's hit with just the right um, energy light, that energy can be absorbed. And what happens when infrared light is absorbed by a molecule is we, we, uh, it undergoes vibrational ex vibrations. We say that the molecule becomes vibrationally excited. Now what does that mean? Well, here we have a hydrogen chlorine bond, so the only motion that can happen is this chlorine can move closer and away from the hydrogen. So we call that, bond, that, we call that stretching of the bond. It's, it stretches and compresses. And we would, so that molecular vibration um, is the result of, in, uh, of absorption of our light. Now, how can this help us uh, analytically? How can this help, help us analyze a sample and learn something about its structure? Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to irradiate the sample with IR light, and we're going to record the frequencies that are absorbed. So we're going to pay attention to which frequencies are absorbed by the molecules and which ones are not, which ones are just transmitted. Okay, because it turns out that certain functional groups have characteristic absorption. So if you have, for example, an OH group in your molecule, OH groups absorb a certain wavelength of uh, infrared light. And so if we see an absorption at that wavelength, that tells us that uh, our molecule has an OH group on it. So it's going to be iron analysis is a way for analyzing for functional groups. Now, it turns out that the intensity of the absorption, how strongly the molecule absorbs that light, uh, is proportional to the change in dipole. So if we have something that is not polar, a bond that is not polar, then it's not going to be um, uh, something that will absorb IR light. So for example, let's take a look at a molecule, a more complicated molecule, like carbon dioxide. If we take, if we take CO2 and we irradiated with infrared light, what can happen? How can this molecule become vibrationally excited? Well, one thing it can do is the, the, the CO bonds can bend. The oxygens can bend toward one another. So we can maybe draw that motion like this. And we would describe that motion as bending. And that would be one, uh, a certain wavelength of light will can be absorbed to that will correspond to that motion now another thing that carbon dioxide can do is we can have stretching of bonds like we saw here and so we can have both of these oxygens stretching and getting longer and shorter and longer and shorter because they're going um, in sync we call this a symmetric stretch symmetric stretching motion, or we can have a motion where as one carbon oxygen bond gets longer, the other one gets shorter. We call that an asymmetric stretch or an anti-symmetric stretch. Now it turns out that uh, because carbon dioxide is a nonpolar molecule, 
not each of these each of these motions would result in a change in the dipole of the molecule. Now, if you if you bend the oxygens in one direction, that's going to now make the molecule a polar molecule. So that definitely changes the dipole, and that would have a signal in the IR. Okay, but if I were to pull these two oxygens at, in the same uh, in opposite directions with the same force, that would keep the molecule nonpolar. There would be no change in dipole. And therefore, there would be no absorption, meaning there's no signal. There's no signal in the IR for that motion. But if we were to stretch the molecule like this, where one oxygen, both oxygens move in the same direction, then it's going to um, have a change in dipole, and we get a signal here. Okay, so this is just one little note uh, of all the peaks that we're going to be observing in the IR spectra we're going to be, um, we, we should recognize that all of the motions we're describing do result in a change of dipole. Otherwise, we wouldn't, they wouldn't appear in the spectrum and we wouldn't even be able to observe them.